Releasing in Australian cinemas and uh, digitally is a new film, Australian film, uh, from Bounty Films called In the Room Where He Waits. Um, a rather intriguing claustrophobic thriller. And it's uh, my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of the film, Timothy Despina Marshall. Timothy, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you. What was the inspiration behind this film, which is uh, quite a, an intriguing thriller? Uh, look, there was there was a few different inspirations for this. I've I've been a horror fan ever since I was young, uh, you know, growing up in the 90s and enjoying, you know, all of the, the Freddy Kruegers and the Halloweens and the Friday the 13th. Um, and I think as a queer filmmaker, I was really excited to find a way to reimagine horror through a queer lens. You know, often horror films, especially when I was growing up, the queer character was often the monstrous, monstrous character, the outsider. Um, and, and sort of almost seen as, you know, the first to die or the monstrosity. And I think it, it's really exciting for me to see how queer representation on screen has changed a lot in recent years. And I, yeah, look, I really love a, a horror film similar to Hereditary. Uh, it follows even The Shining, um, where, you know, there is something obviously a lot deeper going on beneath the horror and the horror is speaking something deeper and um, certainly during the pandemic um, as a lot of people were facing you know a lot of challenging experiences one of which being loneliness and I was really curious to use the horror elements of someone trapped in a hotel room to I guess confront that confront this feeling and uh, fear I guess of loneliness and of aging and particularly through a queer lens um having grown up in the 90s as a queer person i know other other queer people can likely relate to this and being fed certain um narratives about how because we're queer we are going to live a lonelier life and how that how we carry that with us and i think i wanted to use the horror element of the film to really i guess explore that Okay, no, that's uh, fair enough. That's a really interesting explanation. Uh, so, tell me about fashioning the screenplay, uh, which is uh, which develops quite a, a head of steam uh, as the story develops. Um, uh, quite an intriguing story, um, which must have taken you a bit of time to develop. Yeah, look, the development process was wonderful. I worked with two other writers, Paradox Delilah and Dimple Raja Guru, in developing the story initially as it was a sort of obviously I came to them with the idea and the themes I wanted to tackle um and yeah each of them brought something really amazing and, and fun to the table and we were able to really um I guess think about how we would bring the horror element in and the psychological element in so that it really became this very tense uh fast-paced almost kind of hellscape uh, that he enters into as he begins to unravel and, you know, really, I guess, physicalise what's going on internally from and really externalise that. Um, so it was always something that we were kind of trying to work towards as to how we would externalise the internal with him and how we, would, how we would actually use the room and the elements of horror that we could bring out in that room to really, um, I guess, yeah, pack a punch in a way because it's a slow burn horror. Right? It's maybe not a traditional horror in that sense and, you know, in the blood and, and guts sense. But um, I always find that, that horrors that are slow burn where, you know, we're not always seeing the thing that's around the corner and the longer that you drag that out, the more terrifying it becomes. So I really wanted to, um, you know, all three of us really wanted to play with that, um, with, the, with the story and the script. And and I like the way um, he sort of communicates via Zoom calls or uh, or with his mother uh, by phone. I, I found that really interesting to bring the outside world into his uh, claustrophobic situation. Yeah, look, I I really wanted it to be that he was only the only person in the room. Um, that was really important to me. Um, obviously, because of the context, you know, we used the idea of, of him being in hotel quarantine as a way to have him trapped um, within the hotel room. Um, 
but I also like the idea that, you know, having these characters only on um, Zoom or on phone calls, it really pushed further on this character and what he was going through in terms of the grief he was experiencing and how isolated he felt personally from everyone else in the world. And obviously he is the type of character that is trying to pretend that everything's fine. So he's much more easily able to do that through uh, phone calls. But yeah, particularly with the mum, like I never wanted him to have a FaceTime with the mum because they have such a disconnect in mm. the film. So it was kind of important to me that it was only ever her voice that we heard um, so that it really, I guess, echoed that disconnect. Yes, yes. Now, tell me about casting, because I've seen Daniel Monks in a number of films, um, and uh, I, I was quite intrigued as to uh, uh, how you decided to cast him and, and of course, Susie Porter uh, as the mother. <laughs> yes. Oh, Susie is so incredible. I mean, Daniel and Susie are both so incredible. I'll speak about, I'll speak about Daniel first. I mean, look, Daniel is... Um, he's just extraordinary. I mean, there's no other word for him. He's absolutely extraordinary. And I had known of Daniel prior to the film. Um, we'd been on the festival circuit together and I adored his feature film, Pulse. Um, when I was writing the film, I always knew that I wanted to have a queer person play the role of Toby. Um, and it was an open casting process at the time um, that I was, you know, looking for queer actors. Um, and that was kind of the only thing that I was looking for, you know, apart from that, it was, it was open. So Daniel, I knew was living in London and actually I just reached out to him on a whim in case he happened to be in Australia and wanted to be considered. And it, it, it's quite extraordinary actually, because he reached back out to me and he said, it's crazy how much this film is reflecting my own life right now. He was, um, he was recently in the seagull on where End alongside Amelia Clark oh, yep. uh, on London's West End. And at the time that I was reaching out to him during COVID, the play was cancelled indefinitely. So mm. he was stood down and he had returned to Perth, done hotel quarantine and was living with his mum. <laughs> so the, the parallels between what he was experiencing in the film were just so amazing. And it was this perfect little window of time that he was available. So it felt, it actually felt really meant to be. Um, and it was a beautiful collaboration with him because, you know, specifically the role, uh, the role, look, the role wasn't written for anyone with a disability, but to Daniel, that was really, really important that, that his disability wasn't written into the role. You know, he really wanted to play a role that actually wasn't focused on, on anything to do with his disability. His disability just was, it wasn't actually why he was cast, which of course it wasn't why he was cast. And so we, we worked very collaboratively on how that would, how that would kind of play out on screen. And it was such an honor to be able to work collaboratively with him on that so that he felt really, I guess, proud of, of the representation in the film. And then with Susie, look, I just wrote her, a, I absolutely love Susie Porter. So I wrote her a lovely letter and, you know, <laughs> just kind of told her how much I admire her and, and we were very lucky that she had a had an afternoon free, and we popped up to Sydney and were able to do all her lines on uh, in the voice studio. So yeah, she's so extraordinary, and and we're very lucky to have her support. Well done. Yes, uh, very good indeed. Um, so how did you direct the film? I, I gather you weren't in the hotel room with Daniel at the time. It was all done remotely. Oh, no, 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 I was there. I was there. Look, we shot this in um, during COVID up in Queensland in Brisbane um, and we shot it at a hotel in Brisbane and look, there were, you know, it, there weren't many people at this hotel. So we actually had the crew almost take over the whole floor of this hotel um, just because we were able to. It was sort of this very rare situation where... Mm the hotel was encouraging the film crew, you know, to, to <laughs> use it as much as possible because there was no one else there. Um, so it was such an, an amazing, it, they were incredible actually. But yeah, look, we we had, I think about four hotel rooms in the one part and what Daniel was staying in one and the gear was in another and the video split in the art department and the unit was in another and then the filming, the set was in another. And so it was very contained. But yeah, look, it was all very up close and perfect. And all that you know that hotel room wasn't big so everyone got to know each other very 
very intimately, I think, by the end of that film, especially with the filming in the bathroom. Uh, DOP Ben Cockgrove was cursing me by the end of having to do some of those scenes in the bathroom and having to contort his way into the bathtub with a camera. And Daniel was, yeah, look, Daniel was very patient in that process. But look, it was also great because it was a small crew and such an intimate process. We all got to know each other really well. And Daniel, I, I, can, I guess I could speak for him in saying that he really loved the experience because, yeah, I mean, it felt like we, we were very um, focused on making sure there were a lot of queer people in the crew um and in the car so it sort of had this really beautiful family environment by the end of it but i guess it also meant that daniel and i had that really great close quarters to collaborate in the way that i was able to direct him um yeah and then i guess the other, the other side of that that i can quickly add is that working with the cinematographer ben cockgrove was amazing because we obviously really carefully designed the way the film would look and be shot um to work with the space that we had and we wanted to really make sure the room felt like it was alive so we 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 did a lot with the room where we added mirrors and we actually used we added a little little um cabinet area that was sort of almost reflective of the idea of the glass menagerie where we could shoot into it and it would refract light left right and center and have all these different reflections and how it would i guess speak to the symbolism of of what Toby was going through. So yeah, it was really fun to, I guess, play with that and, and be creative within our limits, you know? Okay. Well, well done on that. It, uh, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't have been an easy shoot. Uh, did it take long to shoot the film and did you have much uh, production budget behind you? Look, this was the, this was a pretty small budget film. Um, so no is the answer. We didn't have a lot of budget behind us. Um, we did have support from Queer Screen and Queen, Screen Queensland in post-production, which was amazing. Um, but yeah, look, we, we, we filmed it on, on a very small budget to, to get it made. And we shot the film over three weeks. We, we would have loved to have done it over less, but it, I mean, look, shooting a film in less than three weeks, a feature film in less than three weeks is, <laughs> I would say a pretty impossible task. So. Yeah, three weeks, and it was a uh, very go 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 the whole time. Oh, well done on that! And uh, as you said, the uh, and as I I found when I saw the film, the look of the film uh, is is quite impressive. It uh, sort of belies then the the low budget that uh, you would have been working on. Um, t and so tell me also about the music and sound design because that adds uh, quite a feature to the film. Yeah, look, I um. Sound and music is, oh, it's one of my favourite things as a director. I absolutely love um, thinking about how score and sound design can really elevate an emotional experience of watching a film. So, yeah, working with the, the, set, the sound designers, Josh Behan and Andrew Cherry from Third Axis Salon was a very rewarding experience because, you know, we talked about the character journey and, you know, what obviously the emotional experience of Toby was and how we could bring that out in the sound design um, and looking at, you know, these, these different stages of, this, of the quiet of the room, you know, um, experience I think a lot of people have had being in a hotel room and the, even just the hum of the air conditioning mm. can often just sound like it's someone whispering to you through the vents in a way. So we really wanted to bring that out that kind of eerie space um, that Toby was in and really play with, with as much um, sound that we could use there. And then the score was Joseph Twist, who I've worked with previously on some of my short films. And Joseph is, yeah, I mean, extraordinarily talented. And it was, look, really collaborative. I came to him with references and I always knew I wanted to have the screeching kind of undulations of the violin. Um, as the really almost very unsettling score that that meant you can never really sit comfortably uh, while while watching it and get deeper into Toby's experience. So we, yeah, we really collaborated and built that together. And it was, I mean, yeah, hopefully, I, I think it's you know created a really incredibly unsettling <laughs> experience as we'd planned for. But yeah, so much fun. It, it certainly uh, does create that uh, sort of impact. So well done on that. And uh, 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 your conclusion uh, packs quite a punch. Of course, we're not going to spoil it for the audience, but uh, uh, I was w wondering how you were going to uh, get to the uh, the climax of the uh, the story. <laughs> 
Yes, I mean, oh, I don't want to give away any spoilers, no, but yeah, don't. I um, look, it's certainly because it's a psychological horror, you know, we really wanted to think about how we could really use the space to, like I said, reflect what was going on for him internally. Um, and, you know, I was referencing films like um, The Shining, but also like 2001, A Space Odyssey, with how they kind of used the space to reflect psychologically what the character was going through. And, and we did some pretty, uh, yeah, we did some pretty weird and interesting uh, things in the climax to, to bring that out um, without giving away any spoilers. But that was probably one of my favourite things about um, shooting the film was shooting some of those climactic scenes and how we kind of um, used the production design in the room as well to really shift it and change it to become this really horrific uh, space as reflected um, from, you know, what was what he was thinking and feeling in his mind. Yes. Okay. No, well done on that. I, I was quite impressed. So uh, tell me, Timothy, how is the film being rolled out? Yeah, so we are, um, we're, we've got a limited cinema release across Australia happening in June. So we are screening uh, in most of the capital cities. Um, we're screening in Melbourne at the Lido on the 12th of June and the Thornbury Picture House on the 15th of June. Uh, and then in Sydney, the 20th of June. And then we've got more screenings that'll be announced, on course screenings that'll be announced um, likely in, in Brisbane and, and the like as well. And then from there, uh, hopefully digitally, we don't have exact details of where we'll be releasing digitally yet, but um, anyone's welcome to head to my website, tdm, tdmfilm.com, and uh, all the details are on there. Okay, very good. Um, nice to hear that people can see the film, of course, very important, and, uh, and then it'll be rolled out further digitally later. Um, so uh, I'm quite intrigued, uh, Timothy. What attracted you to being a filmmaker in the first place? That's a great question. I love that. What a what a what a delightful and and uh, thought provoking question. Look, I, I I have honestly been interested in film and writing since I was a young kid. I'm one of those kids that was like writing their own like Goosebumps fan fiction when I was ten years old and like distributing it to my friends in the in the schoolyard and. When I was 12, my parents bought me a camcorder and I started making um, horror films with my camcorder. And I used to get the, um, the earphone from my Discman and tape it to the front of the camcorder speaker and then play the Jaws soundtrack on my Discman and then film my friend running through the house with the Jaws soundtrack blaring. So it was like, you know, in camera kind of done. And I, you know, had my screen mask on and the retractable knife and yeah, so... <laughs> I've been a bit of a horror aficionado ever since I was little. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just something that's that's just always been something I've been really drawn to, to, to be a storyteller. And I think as I've grown up, it's become really important to me to um, be a queer filmmaker and, and express queerness uh, through my films. And um, I guess look at – I love looking at deeper topics and unpacking and exploring – deeper themes through my films. You know, it's such a beautiful thing when you can um, play a film and have someone come up to you that is a complete stranger and tell, tell you how much it meant to them or how much they connected to it. It's, yeah, it's really special. So, yes, <laughs> a long journey. <laughs> Okay, no, and a good one. Thanks for describing that. That's a really interesting uh, uh, journey that you have taken. So, uh, Timothy, are you working on another film at the moment? Yeah, look, I've got a few films in development now um, at kind of various stages, um, all, all in early development, but I do have another uh, queer uh, drama thriller that I'm um, really excited about. I can't talk too much about it because it's still in the early stages, but... Yeah, it's hopefully something that's going to be shot here in Melbourne um, now that I'm based down here in Melbourne. Um, yeah, and again, very claustrophobic, but in, a, in an entirely different setting. So I'm excited about that one.
Okay, I hope that all goes well. Uh, well done on that. Uh, and uh, I must ask you, Timothy, last question I love asking all filmmakers, have you seen any other films recently uh, in cinema, streaming, whatever, that have impressed you? Gosh, you know, it's so funny. I haven't, I've been terrible. I haven't been to the cinema lately, but of course I have seen a number of films that have impressed me this year um it's oh gosh you know it's i'm drawing such a blank when you ask me this question i have to like really dial my mind back to the last film do you know what actually i watched um beau travail by claire denis for the first time recently uh it's actually a reference for the film that i'm the next film i'm writing and i've never seen it and gosh it impressed me it just was such a it still to this day feels like such a relevant and and very resonant representation of masculinity um and the way that she captured the visuals of, of those men at the training camp in morocco i don't know if you've seen it but it was just yes. yeah it was so striking such an amazing film so yeah that one Fair enough. No, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good recommendation. And apart from that, I certainly recommend audiences go and see um, In the Room Where He Waits. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to the director, Timothy Despina Marshall. Timothy, thanks so much for talking with me. Peter, it's been such a pleasure. I'm really grateful for you to have had me on the show. Thanks so much. Okay, all the best. See you later.